I'm willing to bet that each one of you has been judged by someone else in this room at, at some point today. I know it's, it sounds strange, but humans are tribal, right? And we, we form teams easily. We look for the smallest cue to decide if someone's in our group or not. And it's likely because we've evolved for intergroup conflict. And I, I think understanding that dynamic is key to understanding the current divisions that we're experiencing in this country, including political divisions. And if you're like me, you're pretty sick of politics, which sounds strange, I know, coming from a politician. Um, but, you know, it's, I'm, I'm the state senator here, and, and before that I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, nearly 10 years with the United Nations, mostly focused in, um, in negotiation settings and conflict analysis in Iraq, Jerusalem, and Syria. And, you know, they clearly liked me. They, they said, what? Int intractable conflict? Uh, civil war? Send Adam. He likes that stuff. Uh, but, but that background means that I'm incredibly interested in understanding you know, what it is that has gotten us here to this moment in our, in our, in our history. And more, maybe, maybe more importantly, how do we extract ourselves? Um, my sense is that we spend way too much time focusing on the, the kind of out outward manifestation of conflict. And my preference is looking at the, the kind of individual and group level dynamics that will help us uh, recreate a national unity. Um, so it's my hope that by the end of today we, we can agree to three different things that will allow us to change our approach to the political process and maybe to all human reaction or, inter or relations for that matter. Um, so it's an easy task. Uh, you know, basically, what I've been focusing on is in, since the 1980s and 1990s, we've seen major shifts in our political process, in media and social media and in the economy. And each of those shifts have actually encouraged conflict. You know, they've torn our social fabric. And here's a, a chart that shows how we've, we've transferred the, the white congressional districts highlighted in 1976 in the top. Uh, they've moved towards landslide districts for Republicans in gray and Democrats in black by the presidential election in 2004. And in trying to explain that, a lot of people point to gerrymandering, right? It's, it's clearly led to fewer um, uh, swing districts and it's incentivized candidates and, and, politi and politicians themselves to you know, be more extreme, to cater to those who are more likely to vote in a, uh, in a primary. And, and so we've seen that. Parties are actually you know, focusing on big data to micro-target uh, in districts down to the block level so that their parties can maintain power in a state. And this, this is the district in New North Carolina that was recently became the first district that was blocked by a federal court for being unconstitutional because of partisan gerrymandering. And also, there's, we've seen another shift in the amount of money entering the political system since the 1980s. And it, it also incentivizes uh, folks to maybe be more more partisan to attract that new money and make sure it's not used against them uh, in, uh, for an opponent. You know, we've also seen shifts in media since 1980. We've gone from those three major network televisions would give a neutral take on the news and they've switched over to cable, and which is now catering to ideological perspectives. And maybe folks even come home and stream entertainment and skip the news altogether. And there were, there were um, economists at the Federal Reserve Bank in Dallas who said that it was this proliferation of media that was the biggest con contr or contributor to um, political polarization amongst the things that they looked at. And part of it, they thought, is it's overlapping with a flaw in our human cognition, which is confirmation bias, right? You, you start with your view, especially when it's moral and political issues, and then you just look for information um, to confirm it. And then, of course, there's the internet. Um, you know, since the 90s and then social media after that, uh, it may not, may not cause division. And we've seen studies that show that older folks who are not necessarily online are dividing at the same rates. Um, but it certainly can amplify division. And so, you know, we've seen in, in so, well, I guess in reality right now, we know that four out of five of your Facebook friends have the same views, same ideological perspective. And we know that you're more likely to read or share news that you agree with. And so if you're like 62% of America right now that gets um, uh, their news online or from social media, 62%, that's a majority, I just did the math for you, 62% um, of America, then you're probably seeing things that you already agree with, you're not seeing the other side. And you, know, you can see that in, in uh, an article I put up two weeks ago on my Senate Facebook page, and this is the exchange that happens. We've seen classic studies that show the, this kind of sense of either, um, you know, perceived anonymity, anonymity or uh, relative distance allows you to be more aggressive. Writing versus talking to someone makes you, or allows you to be meaner. 
Um, and so these are examples of that. I want to talk lastly about shifts in the economy because it's also um, kind of led to this sense of division. We see here now that the majority uh, or the largest industry in the, in the United States in the 1990s was manufacturing in most states, and in manufacturing with, with high paying jobs available to anybody regardless of your education level, and they were replaced by, by service jobs. And so by 2003, you can see that it's now retail and trade that is the dominant in 34 states in the country, and by 2013, it's, it's healthcare and social assistance. And so there's this, there's this kind of, uh, the last 30 years, a wage stagnation, right, as, as those, the, the the dominant jobs have just are paying less and less. And so we've seen by 2014, a third of food stamp recipients uh, actually have somebody in their family who's working and they just can't make ends meet. And there's an element of income inequality as the economy is shifting towards uh, this, these winner take all cities that um, where the, the pay is higher. And if you have a higher education level of education, you're more likely to move to that. And then you can see there where a division emerges. And so you can see, remember from that original um, picture of the spread, it's the parties have become rural, identified as rural versus urban. And people in, in uh, uh, surveys have said that they're more likely to date someone from their own party, not someone from the other side. And they're more likely to not have friends from someone from the other side. So I started by saying, you know, I want to understand the individual reactions to these shifts. And each of these changes are, are measurable problems that, that really start to give the sense of, I'm under attack. And it's conflict 101 that you, know, you have some basic needs to be met. And if they're not, you're in trouble. Right? You need to put food on the table. You need a roof over your head. And if that's not there, we're going to have a conflict. And another universal piece is, is relative deprivation. I need this amount, and I can only get that amount. You know, I used to be able to make this amount, and now I can only make this amount. But somehow I see over there, there's this group of people. They seem to be doing all right. You know, another piece that you, you can see right here is that it's, there's this status inconsistency. What matters? How do you get your worth? Is it, is it the folks with 25 years of experience or is it that advanced degree? And, and whatever you have as a group or an individual, you're more likely to value. And so each of these are triggers for saying, man, okay, we've got a problem here. The, the, the kind of what we need as a group is not consistent with the needs of another group. And that frustration that you might feel can give energy to a response and a reaction, especially if another group is held up as the reason for that misfortune. And so it leads to things like distrust or you know, a feeling that that other group is probably maybe you know, indifferent to your, your needs or even hostile. They disrespect you and your group. And you can see that those, those dynamics are so tangible, so accessible right now, when people are angry. I hear it every day. They're angry. They can't make what they used to, and they're not sure about their kids, right? And it means it feels like a duty to stand up for your group, especially when you feel like you're getting antagonized by another group. So in my mind, in this environment, you know, fighting for securing social mobility and workforce development and, uh, and, and addressing income inequality becomes a matter of national security and national unity. We've reached a stalemate, and essentially we have a point where, you know, we, we no longer are, are making progress in our national conversation or progress at the national government, right? With Congress, um, they can't get anything done, and when they do, they, um, you know, it gets overturned as soon as another party takes over. And so from a conflict perspective, stalemate is not the worst thing, right? It, it can often be a, a moment where we say, okay, maybe we're going to open up and go to the next stage. And so I would press the kumbaya music on here if I had it, but before we get there, um, there is a, there's a sense that um, you know, you're not going to get there when, every, when both sides feel like, no, we've given too much time, too much energy, too much money into this fight. And so the first thing that you have to do is both sides need to realize, okay, we're actually in a stalemate. We're not getting anywhere. And so we also realize the second thing is, you know what? We actually need the other side's consent to reach what we want, or we need them to change their actions. So we need them involved. And so it's time to start putting ideas on the, on the table, proposals that you can work with. The only thing left is problem solving. So what I'm proposing today is nothing short of a new approach to politics, and I'm calling, calling it problem solving politics. Um, and there are three things that we can all do. Three mostly because nobody remembers four and, and five is too many, uh, and so it's three with a couple of subsections. So first, um, people need to be heard, create the space for them. 
Here comes the good news, finally. There was a very recent MIT study that showed that when folks can actually tell their story, explain their cause to someone in the other group, it changes the way they feel about that group. And it kind of gets at this idea that a barrier to reconciliation has been this feeling, this fear that I'm going to be ignored. And so, it, you know, it, typically in conflict situations, we would say, you know what, you just need to understand the perspective of the other side. Or, you know what, we're going we're gonna to move away from the personality and we're going to focus on the issues. But this, this makes it clear that you actually, there is serious opportunity when people are allowed to tell their story, right? We need to be heard again. So I often, we, we focus on making sure there are town halls for folks to um, talk with each other. And all of you can make sure that you're, you're um, allowing that space in your conversations. But go deeper. This is a subsection for you taking notes at home. Um, go deeper. You know, I'm amazed at how often we actually do not talk about the real issue at hand, right? We take a very strong position, but we don't think to ourselves, yeah, you know what, but actually, I, there's probably another way I can get to what I really need. And so I often, are, I'm asking folks, why do you need that? Or what is it you're trying to achieve? And you can find that that, that opens up the possibility of other options for, okay, we might be able to work together. Two, reach out to the other. You need them. Um, you know, I, one of the big concerns that I, I find from the, the shifts that I just described is that when you have this group dynamic emerge and group bonding, you're very quickly able to, to say, you know what, I, I am for my group and I'm going to go after the other group. Or when you have, um, you know, this sense of group support, you're more confident in your positions. And when you have this sense of relative anonymity, it's, it's really easy to be more aggressive and dehumanizing. And, you know, evolutionary psychologists believe that our w minds aren't wired for truth-seeking. They're wired for bonding. And so you're willing to say and do anything to be accepted by the group. And it just keeps going, right? And then, you know, the more that you have that anonymity, you're more likely to just make very simple conclusions out of complex issues and enter confirmation bias again. And you, you're getting information that you agree with and you're not seeing the other side. My point is, it's a powerful dynamic. And it's one that becomes attached to our own self-identity. And it's very easy to start putting folks in a box um, and, as antagonistic. Uh, and so, but I, I want to say that the good news here again is that we do know the antidotes. We do know that human contact actually reduces prejudice. We do know that when someone in your group actually uh, has a friend in the other group, that helps. We know that positive media portrayals of intergroup actions, uh, interactions, that helps. Online contact, even through gaming, good news, even through gaming can help with your feelings of uh, another group. Um, and so I think that it, it's critical that we're um, taking these steps. Um, solve problems, number three, don't win debates. Um, you know, the, a big issue here is that we, uh, I, I feel like we have to go in the automatic um, first step when you see this con contentious interaction and say, all right, we need to shift energy and move towards a process where we can actually talk to get underneath and talk to, uh, about uh, ways that we can actually work together. Part of the challenge in, in these shifts I've described is that um, power has shifted. Right? If the old way was that, okay, we're going to get power, we're going to create our lines, we're going to uh, use our money for influence, we're going to get the politicians we like, we're going to get the policies that will help us, that doesn't work if there's a stalemate and the, the policy is going to change as soon as someone new comes in. And so for me, the, where we are now is that the, the real power described as getting other folks to, to work with you to meet your needs, it comes from relational powers. And it comes from uh, you know, working with folks so that you can actually understand each other and get to something that's sustainable. It, comes, it grows out of restoring the reciprocal obligation of democracy. I love that word. And so at some point, you know, you'll have to, you might want to take a stand and it helps for leverage, but at some point you're going to have to take the time to be with each other in a problem solving process to really get um, what you want. Now, um, you know, it, it, problem solving isn't easy. Uh, we've, uh, we use it in Iraq. We use problem solving politics in Iraq when I was there with the United Nations and mostly focus on the north of the country, the Kurdistan region, uh, divided from the rest of the, the country. And it resulted from Saddam mostly pushing the Kurds out of these disputed areas, a fault line from Syria to Iran, and he used chemical weapons at times. And the result was this very contentious, existential conflict. And the Kurds said, well, we know the answer. We just have to have a referendum on these areas, and the winner can take the, the territory. And of course, that would just lead to more conflict. Whoever lost was likely to fight. And so we needed a new approach. And we spent a year and a half flying around, sometimes in Black Hawk helicopters, landing in, in far-off desert villages, 
probably conducted over 100 interviews, and in each one of those conversations, we couldn't start the conversation about problem solving and getting to a negotiation without first letting them tell their story about how the attacks and oppression impacted them personally. And so eventually we could, we got to the point where we could say to folks, give them dignity of recognition and saying, we know over that mountain that Saddam attacked a village 30 years ago. And we want to make sure that never, ever happens again. But to get that level of security, you're going to need Baghdad. You're going to need the other side. Otherwise, they'll just line up their tanks and bring jets. And so let's get to the negotiation table. And so we did. We started a process where we could talk about mutual interests. But it was, it was that being heard and understanding the value of the other side and having a process to enter, it's what mattered. And so this is what it looks like here in the district. We're very clear about setting up a process to identify issues that matter and get the right people in the room and, and, and set up a problem-solving process. Uh, we had a 15-year-old shoot a 17-year-old, broad daylight, morning commute on the side of the road. And, and the community was up in arms and a lot of tension about which, which neighborhood is to blame. And so we said, you know what, we've got to create a forum for folks to talk. They have to hear each other, including members of the family of those impacted. And this was the result, you know, 250 people in a room, maybe more, wanting to be a part of the process. And so we made sure that there was a, uh, there was a very clear path for how you're going to um, bring in the right people and start a problem-solving process. It resulted in a common project, uh, a mentoring program that, that still flourishes today. So, you know, problem-solving politics isn't easy. Um, I'm still told by folks, don't talk to me about problem solving. You know, I know I'm right. You need to say it publicly. And if you don't, I'm never going to vote for you again. And you know, I get it. Given these dynamics, it's hard not to feel like it's, you need to be aggressive in the face of aggression. But this isn't about capitulating. This isn't about giving in. This is actually about how to identify a way to get more of what you need. It's also not about just meeting halfway, particularly with groups like white supremacists, right? Um, you have to stand for your principles. We have to stand for overcoming racism and um, gender equality and LGBTQ rights. But it's to, when you're standing up for your principles, it is that contact and shared experience that is going to get us there and work together and reduce hate. And finally, it's also, it's not about just kind of moving to the center to represent all sides. It's, it's about solving problems so that, and, and just landing wherever that lands, quite honestly. So, um, I just wanted to conclude and say that what I'm asking of you today is to demand that your elected officials not buy on, buy on or anyone you're talking to in politics about, uh, not buy into this divide and rule tactic. You know, remove social support for that approach. Demand and reward that they take on a problem-solving politics approach. And you can, take, you can commit yourself to say, you know what, I'm going to take those three steps myself. Next time you see something that's offensive, take a breath, maybe don't tweet right away, and, and kind of say, you know, I hear you, your experience matters, let's talk a little deeper and figure out what your real needs are. You know, by the way, this is how the other side sees it, and here's why, but hey, let's lock arms and, and work like hell to make sure this never happens again. And so, you know, I feel like the bottom line is we're not defined by being Democrat and Republican. We're defined by who we are together, right? That's how the world sees us. That's how we feel about what's happening in this country. And we've defined a, an approach here locally we think is, can be replicated across the country. We can create a style of politics uh, that we can believe in. We can create a style of communication that matters, that we can be proud of. And that is the way we're going to get through this contentious moment in our history with our heads held high, because we want to make sure this division never, ever happens again. Thanks a lot.